from a multitude of highly secure top secret locations across South Texas. This is the official restart edition of the Spurs Insider Podcast. I am Mike Finger here with Nick Talbot, and despite all of Jeff McDonald's efforts to derail this return, Tom Ringo Starr Orsborne is back on the podcast, and Tom Orsborne, we're going to start with you. The NBA is about to get started, but what does it feel like to be talking and reporting on basketball again? Uh, it's good. It's good, Mike. I'm, I'm glad to be back. Uh, it was an interesting couple of months, but uh, made me really appreciate sports. <laughs> so it's yes. good to be back. Yes. Uh, we, we, we sung your praises last week, uh, but to do it again, Tom did a great job on news, and now it is good to be talking about sports again. And on Friday night, your San Antonio Spurs are going to take the court in uh, Orlando, Florida at Disney World uh, in the first of eight seeding games. And I'll open it up to anybody who wants to talk about what you are most looking forward to seeing in all this. It'll be interesting I mean, I think, to see if, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, well, I think it's <laughs> hard to deal with. We can edit this out. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Yes. Um, probably about the same thing that uh, Greg Popovich says that he is looking forward to seeing, and that's sort of what the young guys look like, how they fit, how they mesh, um, what that sort of future um, – future lineups might look like. I, I, I think the Spurs are kind of taking the right approach here in that if you can make the playoffs, fine, and you know definitely don't try to lose games, but the real, the real benefit for them is in that player development and having uh, this time in the bubble, not just the eight games, but the training camp, the scrimmages, uh, the practices, um, all that time to sort of sort out what, what, what the future might look like uh, as opposed to uh, you know, going gung ho after a playoff berth that uh, you know may or may not be um, realistic. See, that is the kind of incisive analysis that made it worth all of Jeff McDonald's reschedulings of this week. He made it so difficult for us to get all to get to get together and do this podcast because we needed that insight, and uh, that that's just great stuff. Tom, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> well, just a piggyback piggyback off that analysis uh yeah just just seeing Derek and Derek White DeJounte Murray Lonnie Walker playing together in the starting lineup um you know it it seems like they they finally gained some chemistry um against the Pacers it seemed like they were kind of clicking everyone seemed comfortable um and uh, it's just just continue to see that growth and, and that 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 uh, unit play together is, uh, is what I'm looking for. Yeah, and um, like like Jeff had mentioned, I, th- I think Greg Popovich, in one of his several Zoom appearances, which is just kind of an incredible part of a sentence to say, it's kind of a sign of the times as we're now we've now gotten used to seeing and hearing Greg Popovich on Zoom. Um, he pointed out that. Yes, of course, there will be a time when when competitive juices start flowing and the Spurs are going to be playing to win. But this guy, this 71-year-old man who many have speculated might be nearing the end of his career, is talking about how this is a chance for development. And uh, I think the Spurs, of all the teams that are in Orlando, uh, maybe Washington would be another, but the, the Spurs have been the most open about how this isn't just about competing for this year's playoffs or championship or whatever that this is about seeing the guys that you guys mentioned um how they can fit in and and what can happen for the future of this organization and uh i think that puts them in a little bit of a different boat than a lot of the other teams and i I think this really can be a beneficial thing for the the franchise if uh like you guys had said there's this this backcourt of DeJounte Murray and and Derek White and Lonnie Walker how does that fit is DeMar DeRozan going to be back I think that there's there's a whole other dimension to what the Spurs are experiencing than than what everybody else is yeah and it's worth question you know it's 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 worth the question uh if this is the goal that development is the goal like what what is DeMar DeRozan thinking what is Rudy Gay thinking 
what is Marco Bellinelli, these older older guys that are there for what reason exactly? Just to kind of mentor these guys or like they're putting they're, they're risking their health for 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 what? Well, they're 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 paid professionals. Um, they're fulfilling sure. their contract. Um, but I I've sort of gone back to the idea, and and there's 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 been two changes that I've noticed in terms of how I'm looking at certain older people on this team and how this restart, this delay, this whole situation has affected their futures. And those two older people, and older is a relative word, but Greg Popovich and DeMar DeRozan, um, when we were on that last road trip, or I guess the last home game against Dallas back in March. That was 400 years ago. 400 years ago. um, If we would have had a podcast then and talked about the future of Greg Popovich and DeMar DeRozan, I think I would have cited – on the on the side that said neither one of them would be back next year because it seemed like the the uh, general consensus was that Greg Popovich was going to go coach the Olympic team in July 2020, which would be going on right now, by the way, and uh, Demar Derozan would be able to opt out of his deal and get a longer deal elsewhere. Now I think that that this the way this has unfolded kind of makes me. Um, come down on the side of I'd expect both of them to be back and to your question of what is DeMar getting out of this um, I just don't know if if he's going to be in a position to turn down a guaranteed 20 million dollars which is he has the option to do from the Spurs this offseason 27 I think right 27 million and um, if he decides that he can play with this group and it's an intriguing group. If, if, if him playing the four with those three guards, uh, that might give him some insight into what his future with the Spurs could be. So um, I think there's a lot for a guy like DeRozan to get out of this in terms of uh, the decision he has coming up as to whether or not he'll be back. And maybe he decides they've moved past me, $27 million or not $27 million, I need to go someplace where I can play my position and have a spot but this might end up being the best spot for him. And, and, and that's something else to look for in these games as to, to how he can fit on a team that's going young. Well, let's, let's talk around the assumption that DeMar DeRozan is back and this is their starting lineup. I mean, I guess, you know, LaMarcus Aldridge instead of Jakob Bertel. Right. Uh, right. What does that look like and how does that function and who makes the three pointers? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, um, you're, you're, if LaMarcus is your starting five he becomes one of those guys of the, we, we forgot remember one, 400 one, years ago at the start of the season he was one of their best three-point shooters and Lonnie Walker here's, here's, I'm not, uh, Lonnie Walker hasn't he in these in some of these scrimmages shown a propensity for the corner three like that could be a part of it I think Derek White has Derek is, is getting no better way. there all along they're they're not going to be the Rockets but for the fans out there who um, fret over the idea that the Spurs are caught up in the last century and don't move forward, this would be like if they open next season with those four guards plus LaMarcus Aldridge, or even if LaMarcus leaves those four guards in some kind of center. I mean, that is that is a big moving forward into the new NBA type of look. I, I, did, I, not, I did not quite realize this till I was writing stories this week. Um, and but Lonnie Walker is actually shooting better than 40% from three this year. Now it's not a huge volume at all, right? but I mean, it's not like he's shooting 20 either, 20% either. So, you know, maybe that's something he can do. Derek White sometimes looks like a three point shooter to me. And then sometimes, you know, but he still just makes 35% for his career. So I don't know if he could get that number up. That would help. Derek is the, uh, such an intriguing player. You know, you keep, I, I keep wanting him or, or hoping that he can go back to what we saw uh, for a couple of games against Denver last year in the playoffs, but they just can't, he can't seem to reach that level of consistency yet. And uh, that's going to be a great challenge, I think, for them during the off season, whatever the off season looks like and, and going into next season, seeing if he can develop even more, um, you know, such such great potential that we saw against against the Nuggets, but they just right. need to bring that out of them. And, and then we'll, 
where does Kelvin Johnson fit with all that is the other question. Yeah, because yeah. I think that kid is might be the best of all of them before it's all said and yeah. done. He could be. And, and I mean, that even if he doesn't fit into the starting group, I mean, one, one concern that the Spurs had early on in terms of playing um, – Derek and DeJounte together, one reason why they didn't is because they wanted one of those guys with the with the second unit. If you have a Keldon Johnson kind of allowed to be the star on the second unit, unit that could solve that issue. But but uh, and we, we can talk some more about Keldon a little bit, but one thing I wanted to get to on Tom's point about Derek White and the potential there, um, I think if you look around the NBA in recent years, one thing we've kind of learned is that three-point shooting can be a skill you can work on and that just because player X does not make a lot of three-pointers or shoot well from three-point range one year, there's a lot of those types of guys who have worked on it and improved. I mean, all the way down to like uh, Brooke Lopez all all of a sudden became a three-point shooter overnight. And the common denominator there is these guys who are talented athletes that work at something. And uh, I think – no one would dispute the fact that either a Lonnie Walker or a Derek White would be able to put in the work to become a competent, if not above average, three-point shooter. I, I think there's just a lot of mm-hmm. upside with that lineup. And uh, again, we're we're putting a cart way, way before the horse, assuming that that lineup is the one we'll see next year. But there's, tomorrow, there's a lot of ways for it to work. <laughs> What's that? We don't even know that's going to be the lineup we see Friday, you know? Well, right, right, right. Well, we won't see LaMarcus, but yeah. Right, sure. Um, but yeah, go tell, tell us more about Keldon Johnson because um, he's a guy of all the players we talk about on this podcast that people have probably seen the least. He was starting to play a little more on that last road trip before the, the pause. And I think more than anybody has, has really used this Orlando thing to his advantage. Right. Of all the first round rookies they've had come in in a while, like probably since Kawhi, he's the first one that looks like physically ready to play in the NBA. Just like he has the body for it already. And I think he just turned 20. So he's got a lot yeah. of like literal physical growth that could happen. And then, and then aside from that, he just has just this sort of uh bulldoggedness about him. What did pop call him a Mustang? Like he's just, he's the just, Mustang. he's just, I, I assume he meant the Mustang like the uh, like like the horse and not the car, right. but right. E- right. either one probably works. Like he's just um, got this motor that I think um, even even at a point in his career where he really doesn't know what he's doing, he's able to affect the game and uh, make positive plays and a positive impact on the game just by like playing his butt off. And then he's got the physical skills to take contact and give contact and seems to really relish the defensive end of the floor. Um, and so all those things are uh, like, they pretend good things and you can see why the coaches want to get him on the floor in a situation like this um, as, as much as they can. Should we let our boss get a word, a word oh, in? Is he here? <laughs> Nick, are you still there? I'm still here. I'm still here. No, in your we... secure location. Do you have anything to add to anything that your employees have said so far? Well, honestly, I agree with Jeff. I think Keldon Johnson is going to be really one to watch. Uh, and really, it's going to depend on what the Spurs do going forward. I mean, when when or if De- DeMar ever leaves, does he fill that hole? Do you go with four, four guards like that? And, of course, on the DeMar point, how does he even fit in at the four? I mean, obviously, he's not going to be a stretch four. Um, yeah. I don't think he's going to be, like Finger said, some people learn how to shoot the three. I don't think that's ever going to be Mars game. So how, nope, probably I'm not. to see how he, he adjusts to playing the four. Rudy Gay adjusted to it very well, and then now Rudy Gay is going to be playing some of the five. And didn't, didn't, just to see how didn't, some of these old guys adjust to being, you know, playing down low now. Yeah. And what, what changes in DeMar Rosen's game? Does anything change at all? Well, as DeMar pointed out to Jeff on a Zoom call this week, um, I believe that was – he was talk, answering a Jeff question. Um basketball is kind of getting more positionless by the year. Isn't that what he said? And, uh, you know, I, I don't think his – sure, he might be guarding an opposing four when he plays that position, but I don't think what he does with the ball is going to change that much because he's playing that position. As we mentioned earlier, you know, the, the spots where he likes to be aren't necessarily the spots where Lonnie Walker and Derek White and 
DeJounte Murray are going to be. I, I, I think the whole idea of DeMar DeRozan, the power forward, isn't totally accurate just because he occupies that spot in the lineup. I think it's, I, I think it can work. Like I'm not predicting a championship here, but I, I think there's reason for optimism about um, where everything is headed. I, I agree with that, but it's boy, four, who, who kind of guards, yep. who does DeMar guard? Right. That's what I was going to get to. Or the bigger four, or what have we kind of seen in that so far? Well, uh, I mean, it, it depends team. For, not every team starts what Paul Millsap or, you know, name your Anthony Davis at the four. I mean, there's a lot of other small fours out there and it could also, I mean, matchup by matchup, DeJounte Murray might be the biggest defender, <laughs> you know, to match up against a, uh, a, a, a long and lean opposing four. Uh, it might depend on what style each person plays. I think there'll be a lot of matchup by matchup. If Keldon Johnson is ever out there, in the four position, I could see him guarding a, a big guy because he's like Jeff mentioned, he's got that strong body to him. I, and as, as often as like DeRozan might be at a disadvantage on defense against a lumbering power forward, well, he's going to have that advantage on the opposite end. Um, I, 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 I just sort of am looking forward to, to seeing all the different facets and permutations of this. I think once you get things. once you wrap your your mind around this problem, maybe isn't a playoff team like that's not a not that's not a like a do or die goal. It becomes uh-huh. easier just to like let's see what happens and and yeah. uh, you know if, if it doesn't work, whatever. But it just be it, it becomes more interesting than um like if you were trying to do this on a team that had championship aspirations or was a surefire playoff team, and you uh, you might. You might look at the negatives a little more, but I, I think in the situation the Spurs are in and are going to be in for the foreseeable future, I think it's I think it's kind of fun and experimental for sure. What, what, what do you oh, think? Trey, uh, Trey Lyles, of course, we had mentioned him. Um, you know, he was playing awfully well at the end of the, before the break, and then you know probably would have played well here in Orlando, and then and then the rest of the bench. What is it going to look like next year? Is Bryn still back? Is what is Jakob going to get an offer that takes him elsewhere? I think those Tyler are, Teller is going to be the linchpin of the whole thing. That's what I think. <laughs> those are interesting steal. questions, Tom. And this is not a this is not a slight at any of those names you mentioned. But on a right. good team, all those guys are bench guys, and they just yeah. kind of fit in. Like Trey Lyles is not the starting power forward or center of a championship contending team and so right. if if the net result of all this new lineup tinkering means that trey lyles becomes a very very good uh backup power forward or a, a, a solid guy you'd like with that unit or that um you know yaka purtle get becomes a solid backup center i think that's great for everybody um i think that's a really good they'd love to have that problem if at the end of this they say oh how are we going to get minutes for trey lyles you know, I, I think that's a good, a good problem to have. And in terms of Brent Forbes, uh, I have been on record many times about how he is a one of the success stories of this organization. I mean, it, any organization in the league would take that kind of production from an undrafted guy. Uh, and I mean, he's 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 done more than they ever expected of him. If he gets an offer from somebody else paying him a few million dollars, I think they're fine with letting him go just because their backcourt is so full right now. And uh, again, no slide on Brent Forbes, but there's when you when you look at what they need and, and, and where their areas of, of depth and not depth are, I, I, I think it's Brent For- signing Brent Forbes is probably not the top priority of this team in the offseason. Yeah. Well, my, my, I was just trying to say, you know, the bench could look totally different. Oh, yes. Too. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And and we haven't even gotten to the idea that they'll have another not terrible first round draft pick this year. Um, yeah. Could be a lottery pick. Could be a lottery pick. They've done good with lottery picks. They should try to do that more often. Well, and <laughs> have have they have they thought about trying to win the draft lottery this year? Is that is that did anybody ask Pop that? I'm having some uh, flashbacks to pre uh, pandemic podcasts 
where tanking and things like that were brought up. And it just, it seems like 400 years ago. Um, but, but on the, on the subject of competing for a playoff spot or following, following the lottery, um, which will be determined over the next eight games. And they have to move up a spot to get into the ninth spot, which would put them into a, uh, a little mini playoff for that eighth spot. It gets kind of convoluted there, but such is life. Um, when we're talking about this new lineup, I think the Spurs more than any other team are an unknown heading into this week because they're going to, they, they seem to be ready to play such a different lineup and such a different group and such a different way than they did before it. And uh, I could see it all working well and them competing for that ninth spot up until the end, or they could just completely fall flat. But uh, if you looked at that third scrimmage where they played, who was it, the Pacers? Yes. Um, it looked like a team that was sort of yeah. figuring out it out this new this new group together and 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 i think they have as much potential as anybody to improve throughout the course of this orlando thing because the other teams kind of are what they are the spurs are are kind of learning something new and and again i'm not predicting success here or even um you know three or four wins they could end up going two and six which is i think is what vegas put their odds at but uh as as this group kind of figures itself out, I think there's there's upside. Under normal circumstances and a normal, many, we're talking. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it'd be interesting to see how many players in Orlando will kind of follow what is happening with Rudy Gay right now. The the break obviously uh, was great for him. Yeah. I mean, uh, his legs and everything. I uh, just just got a new spring in his step, and it's going to be interesting to see how many veterans uh, kind of are rejuvenated like that. Uh, under no, I was going to say, under normal circumstances, you'd wonder about a team sort of reinventing itself in you know in the final home stretch of the season and, and revamping its lineup, and you'd wonder about chemistry and would they know how to play together, and would there be growing pains and losses that come with with trying to to learn itself and maybe that's not a good thing to do in the middle of a playoff hunt but i mean who's going to have chemistry in in orlando after four months like it seems like everybody is starting from ground zero as far as that as far as that goes yeah yep um and that was trenchant I mean, that's what we call trenchant. yes it was i want to go back to nick because uh, last week i asked him about uh having a, a fine employee like Tom Ringo Starr Orsborn, who was able to step in and just do wonderful things uh, with, without batting an eyelash. And I wanted to ask Nick about the difficulty of, uh, of uh, being in charge of Jeff McDonald. And you, we, I, I mentioned several times <laughs> during this podcast, how difficult he made it to, to get us all together. Also, Jeff can defend himself, but uh, he's not going to come back. Ass, always. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. Oh, I just, just have to complete pain in the ass. But we love him anyway. <laughs> yes. Jeff, can you defend yourself as to how many times this uh, this podcast was rescheduled to suit your uh, <laughs> suit your needs? I just want the to know. The funny part is he probably rescheduled this all around so he could go get a Polar Pop and so he could do the, pol- right. the Polar Pop while he was doing the podcast. Well, I will say the best part of doing these from home is that when you guys get boring, I can just get up and walk away and go use the restroom and then come back. Instead of when we're when we're locked in that room, I can't just get up and leave because it becomes kind of obvious that I'm I'm bored by you people. Um, we might be losing listeners here, but the loyal listeners always want to hear about beverages. And uh, Tom Ringo Star Orsborn, what has happened with the salmon coffee mug? Is that oh, still around? It is. It is still around. Um, yeah, very much cherished and. Uh, I think of you whenever I use it, as a matter of fact. Uh, so you wow. have used it throughout the pandemic? Yes, yes. And you, yes. you took it home, though, right? Yeah, but I was okay. I was in the office quite a bit. So oh, that, that I, thing is I covered in COVID. Yeah. And, Je- <laughs> well, and Jeff, when office. was your last uh, Polar Pop? Um, uh, Like 10 minutes ago or 10 minutes before uh, I started well, talking to people. Well, this is positive. Like people have told me, 
They turn to sports. They turn to the Spurs Insider Podcast for a sense of normalcy. And <laughs> obviously, we have a long way to go uh, in terms of coming back from this. And, uh, you know, we, people need to take it seriously. But as an inspiration, Ringo is still has the uh, salmon coffee cup. Jeff McDonald's still getting polar pops. We're still doing Spurs Insider from a secure location, several secure locations. And you can still subscribe to the Spurs Nation newsletter um, and check out all the Spurs coverage on expressnews.com. That's going to be there for you um, through, the, through all of this. And I'm just hoping that in some way that this, uh, this insider podcast can, can bring us all back to, to where we were before this. And uh, You drove a ahead. long way for that plug. A long well, way. That was that was the roundabout route to that plug. It was not it was sure ex- it was worth it. It was extemporaneous. The guy kind of remembered in the middle of the you know crossing the river there that I needed to mention the uh, Spurs N- Nation newsletter, which all our listeners can subscribe to and get all our Spurs coverage. It would help us out a great deal. And uh, anyway, just just wanted to get back to that. I think people need it. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Sounds good. Um, what is what is going to determine whether or not by the time we do this next one, uh, whether we're talking about the still uh, possible scenario of the Spurs making the playoffs, or if by in a week from now they're just completely out of it? Like what? Yeah. What's what? Go ahead. The answer to that is the same thing it was on, you know, October the first. It's whether whether the kids pull it off or not, and how, how what kind of leaps they have made, and how well they play. Tom, well, it's it's a great point. I, I forgot who brought it up earlier, but it's it's you know throw out the scouting report. Uh, if if teams are expecting the Spurs to be like they were, I mean, it's just a total curveball, um, you know. You don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. That, that makes makes them so intriguing in Orlando. Yeah. Nick. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with Tom there. Uh, I think the, the thing that's going to really determine whether or not they make the playoffs or not and get that eight or nine is, is, is these kids and whether or not they can come together and find that fit. You know, this new lineup where DeMar plays the four and the three are together. The Spurs stick with it. And if they can gel faster than some of these other teams that have been off uh, for as long as they have. And in some ways, I think it gives them an advantage because everyone's been off. So if you're going right. to try something new, try it now, and maybe you can pull it together faster than you would if, if this is an 82-game season and it's right. 98 games at the end. I think we might have mentioned last week, the last uh, podcast, um, that motivation uh, will have a lot to do with outcomes in these seeding games, um, who has something to play for, who doesn't. It's it's kind of easy to imagine that that teams that kind of have everything set up for them already, whether it's the Lakers who have this huge lead for the first seed, um, or uh, just just name your team in there, um, how they, they might be tempted to coast through some of these games and not put in a great effort. Maybe some of these teams that the Spurs are fighting with for that last playoff spot they get frustrated after a loss and decide they're not going to fight for it anymore. Um, getting back to what we talked about earlier, the Spurs kind of have these kids that are uh, new to this and trying to prove something for next year, and that could work to their advantage. So maybe just the, the newness of it all and the, and the idea that like Lonnie Walker is excited to be out there and Keldon Johnson is excited to be out there, maybe that gives them a bit of an edge. Um, we, will, we will have to see. Uh, closing thoughts from everybody on on uh, on heading into this restart, which begins. What is it? Friday night at seven o'clock Central Time against the Sacramento Kings. That is correct. I hope this goes better than Major League Baseball's restart. That's my that's my main take from all of this. I just I hope it goes better than Major League Baseball, and it looks like it is. Fingers still crossed, though. Yeah. Um, well, the 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 idea that the NBA is in a bubble and Major League Baseball isn't. That works in their advantage. Um, so I, will... I, have a, I have a question about that. Why not okay. make the whole country out of the bubble? <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes. I actually would 
with that idea might vote for you for president. Um, but I'm actually going to be Kanye's running mate. So <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, I didn't. I was not aware of that. But we just broke some news. Keep that, keep that on, the, on the DL as uh, as Kanye likes. To say. The running, <laughs> yes. Jeff McDonald, uh, West McDonald, 2020. Uh, what could go wrong? That is also the slogan for. What do you have the, to lose? The the what do you have to lose? What could go wrong? That is the Spurs slogan for Orlando and the NBA restart, which begins Friday night. We will be back next week with another Spurs Insider podcast. In the meantime, we will be doing our best to cover all this uh, through Zoom and. Uh, uh, across the country and again check us out expressnews.com subscribe to the newsletter we will be back with you next week until then take care of each other and keep it real